This is a year that the children will be blessed in the presence of the Lord and in the, in the, in the family dynamic. The children are not going to be left out. That was one word God gave us this year, that your children are going to be blessed. Praise God. They're going to hunger for the things of God. They're going to want, they're going to want the things of God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I'm going to read from the book of Exodus. Uh, we spent uh, a little bit of time on this a couple weeks ago on a Saturday night, but I'm going to approach it from a different point of view. Exodus 15 and verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Now, it, the, the background is here is when they crossed the Red Sea, uh, the, the water rolled up, they came across the, on dry ground, and Miriam is leading praise and worship with her tambourine. She's dancing and praising, and the ladies are, are leading a, a spiritual uh, um, a revival, so to speak, because they're excited because they've crossed over. They, they're singing in verse 21, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider has been thrown into the sea. That which has been pursuing us from Egypt is now no more, and we are delivered. Hallelujah. So Moses brought them out from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days into the wilderness and they found no water. Everybody say they found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah, which means bitterness or poisonous. That is a better name. The waters were poisonous and uh, they couldn't drink the water there. And the people complained against Moses, saying, uh, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he, and he cast it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. The tree is symbolic of uh, um, the cross. And so when you look to the cross, uh, there is redemption, there is righteousness released, when we believe in what Jesus did for us. Amen? How many know Jesus paid the price so that we can be healed, that we can be delivered, that we can be made free in every way? And so uh, it says in verse 26, and he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I brought out, uh, 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 that I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Wherever you see an I am scripture, it never gets erased. He is still the Lord who heals you. You cannot say today that he doesn't heal everybody or he doesn't want to heal everybody because he said, I am the one who heals you. He is the great I am. He is our healer. He is our deliverer. He is our savior. Glory be to God. It says in verse 27, then he, went, then he came to Elam, which there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, so they camp there by the waters. Now I'm going to, I want to talk to you about something that's super important. Uh, turn with me to, just go with me in the New Testament to uh, 2 Peter 3 verse 8. Some of you know this scripture, but I just want you to read it in your own Bible or, or your phone or whatever you're doing there. Um, 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. <clears throat> Peter wrote something that's so important. How many know that Peter was an apostle of the church? And he wrote this. He said, but beloved, do not forget. In other words, he said right off the get-go of this verse 8, 2 Peter 3, verse 8. He said, this is something that's so important that you never forget this. He says, do not forget this one thing. If you, don't, if you forget everything else, don't forget this one thing. That with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Wow. Peter said, this is something you never want to forget. That a thousand years in our time is like a day to the Lord. It's so important that as you read the Bible, there's so many things that are, that are prophetic and they're, they're analogies. And uh, the, God teaches us things about day three. Everybody say the third day. How many know it was day three that Jesus got up from the dead? He was raised from the dead, and, he, and, and his dead body began to breathe, and he was resurrected on the third day. Everybody say the third day is resurrection day. 
Now, if you don't understand it prophetically, we are in the third day since Jesus was crucified. Because one day is like a thousand and a thousand like a day. And Hosea uh, prophesied that at the end of two days, there would, there would be a revival and, and at the beginning of the third day, there would be a resurrection. He said that, he said that after 2,000 years, there would be a revival and that would move right into an elevated state for the people of God to, to be raptured eventually, but even to see God in a new light. We're in that day. I said, we're in that day. We're in the day of revival. We're in the day of elevation where God wants to bring us into his sight so that we see as he sees and that we agree with it and we move with him in power and in anointing. But it also talks about all kinds of other things that are going to happen on day three. And throughout the Old Testament, there, I, one time, I can't remember when, about four or five years ago, I went through the Bible and I underlined every third day there, that's mentioned. Because we're in the third day, and you got to know what's going to happen in the third day. And one of the, one of the things that is mentioned out of this scripture we just read in Exodus chapter 15 is on the third day, there's going to be dehydration. Everybody say dehydration. Now, I'm, I'm talking to you spiritually. I'm not talking to you physically. But there's, the third day church is going to struggle with dehydration. Say, not me. It says they couldn't find water on the third day. After their exodus in the wilderness, the third day was a dry day. The first day was, and the second day was, and the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? It's a terrible thing, dehydration. About eight years ago, I think it's about eight years ago now, uh, maybe more than that even, maybe 10 years ago, my son and I went down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We camped at the bottom. It was 52 degrees Celsius at the bottom. How many? Oh, man. 15 years ago, I camped at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with my son when he graduated high school. Man, is he that old? Man, I'm getting really old. And, uh, and we camped at the bottom of the Grand Canyon together, and we hiked down. And uh, when you stand on the lookout, if you've ever seen the Grand Canyon, if you've been there, and you stand on the lookout thing and you look down, that's halfway. That's all. You can't see the other half from the lookout station. So we went all the way to the bottom, and we camped at the bottom. And in the second half, the part you can't see, there is no water. And when you get to the bottom, there's water, but there's no water going down the second half of the Grand Canyon. And... Uh, <clears throat> There's people wandering around there that have been down in there for months. And they're delirious. They're out of their minds. And so I said to my friend who took us down because he was a ranger, I said, why can't you just rescue these people? He says, you can't touch them. They're delirious. All we can do is spray water on them. Because, because it's against the law to, to force somebody to do something they don't want to do. So there's these people walking around uh, out of their minds, basically because of the heat, because of delirium. And here are some symptoms of dehydration. He told me this. He said, you know, he said, because I'm glad he coached us, because he said to me, he says, bring something. We're not going to take any sleeping bags. We're not going to take any backpacks. We're not going to take anything. Uh, we're just going to take what you like to eat. Just take what you like to eat. And I said, like licorice? <laughs> he said, yeah. Anything you like to eat is what you take. Don't take stuff you don't like because you won't eat it because you're automatically dehydrated. You will not be able to thwart off dehydration. Everybody that does this is, is dehydrated. And so symptoms of dehydration, let me, let me, uh, uh, how many know it's terrible, dehydration? But uh, <clears throat> it's worse than heat stroke. It's worse than heat stroke. You can think you're normal, but your body will be acting abnormally. Three days I didn't go to the bathroom. Three days, and you're drinking all the time, and you're and and and, and all of the first half, anyways, you're drinking all the time, and you're eating the stuff you like. Like I took stuff like uh, licorice, <laughs> something you can force down because you don't feel like you you want to eat. So you take granola bars or a gorp or something, and and uh, and I said, and then he said, take your shirt off. I said, man, I will look like a a lobster, a big fat lobster. And he says, no, you don't get sunburnt down here. 
It's so dry and that the sun is so indirect that you can take your shirt off at 50 Celsius in the sun and not even get a tan. It's a weird place. But your body acts ab abnormally when you get dehydrated. Here's, here's symptoms of dehydration. Headaches, muscle cramps, low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, delirium, unconsciousness, and swelling of the tongue. <clears throat> Most of the symptoms don't show up till the third day. Everybody say, Most of the symptoms... Don't show up to the third day. And I'm here to suggest to you prophetically that we're on in the third day. Since Jesus was crucified a little over two, year, two days ago, that's why don't be impatient with the Lord. It's only been a couple days. Right? And he's coming back on the third day. And he's bringing us up with him. Glory be to God. Somebody give Jesus praise. Now, let me tell you something. Dehydration is anti-Christian. I'm talking spiritually now. Spiritually, we are not to be dehydrated. <laughs> John says in John 7, 37 and 38, Jesus says in the book of John, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Say, I don't have any excuse. <clears throat> Spiritual dehydration is not to take place to the, in the church. Simply, be, simply because people aren't tapping into the presence of the Lord is why so many are dehydrated. And most of the church of Jesus Christ in this country doesn't even know it. We've become religious. Say, I'm not to be religious. Now, it's interesting to me that when... Moses went up on the mountain, you know the story, he went up on the mountain to, to receive from the Lord the Ten Commandments. He leaves the people of God and he goes up into the presence of the Lord, for the Lord was giving him the Ten Commandments. Most of you know what the Ten Commandments are. They were some rules that they were supposed to follow in the Old Testament. Well, though Aaron's left behind, he's down at the bottom, and what does he make? He makes a golden calf. They're in the desert. Cat, calves, can't not, calves can't even survive in the desert. But they made this golden calf. Camels can survive in the desert. Horse, you don't even want a horse in the desert. But camels can survive for three weeks without water. Three weeks without food, and they can carry 400 pounds. Everybody say, that's a long time and a lot of weight. See, just because we sometimes get into a dry place, sometimes we get into heavy situations. We get into situations that, that we don't understand why we're in such a spot, why it has to be so hot and dry, why it has to be so heavy. We don't have to get dehydrated. Say, I don't have to get dehydrated. And we're not to be dehydrated. We're to be saturated in the presence of a living God. We're to be saturated on a daily basis filled with the Spirit of God. Now, when I, uh, when I was a kid, I, have, I, I, don't, I don't have a doctor now, but when I was a child and my mom took me to the doctor, I remember the, one of the first things that the doctor would do is they had this big, like, uh, popsicle stick thing. And I don't know if they still do this, but when I was a kid, do they still do this? <laughs> Um, when I was a kid and my mom would take me, the doctor would make me go, uh, right? <laughs> and he put the popsicle stick on my tongue, and I thought it was really strange. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason they do that is because sickness is first, uh, first indicated on the tongue, in the throat, in the mouth. Say, sickness is... An indication of sickness is in the mouth, right? Sickness is detected in the mouth. Say it out loud. And that there's spiritual implications to that. When you're not right with God, it's detected in the mouth. 
Israel had been going through the desert and for three days, and the signs of dehydration began to show up. And the, what, the first sign was a swollen tongue. They began to speak things that they shouldn't speak. They, they began to curse and they began to complain and they began to murmur. Where are we going to get drink from? Where are we going to get the water from? How is this going to work? We've been three days and we don't have anything to drink. Their tongues began to get swollen. Everybody say swollen tongues. When your tongue swells, your taste buds minimize. So you can't taste and see that the Lord is good. When your tongue swells, when your tongue becomes infected with dehydration and begins to swell, you can't see, taste and see that the Lord is good. And there's many Christians today that can't see God is good. They think God is doing something against them. They think God's trying to teach them a lesson. They think they're going through something because God is doing it. That the, the signs of the times like earthquakes and famines and pestilences and all these things are God's idea and God's doing it. None of it is true. Their tongue is swollen. <laughs> Say, as the church of Jesus Christ, I have a healthy mouth. This is how we know we're healthy. We don't see what's wrong. We speak what's right. We speak what's good. We speak the truth over the facts. God is good all the time. But they came to these waters, and these waters were bitter. Everybody say bitter. Poisonous, actually. And it was because of their dehydration that they would complain. And they, and they, and they said, where are we going to get this water from that we need to sustain us? Where are we going to drink from? In a negative situation, they started speaking negatively. As Christians, in a negative situation, we are not to speak negatively. You don't, I, I was sharing this last night, don't, sh don't talk about what God isn't doing. Don't talk about what's wrong. Talk about how good God is. Talk about what he is doing. See, that was John the Baptist's problem. He was talking about what God wasn't doing. And all of a sudden, his disciples come back, because Jesus said, go tell John the Baptist, this is when he was in prison about to lose his head, go tell John the Baptist what I am doing. I'm healing the sick, I'm casting out devils, I'm building the kingdom of God, tell him what I'm doing. He was in such doubt, he didn't even know that Jesus, if Jesus was the son of God anymore. First sign of dehydration is a swollen tongue. If somebody's negative towards your praise, or towards your hunger, or towards your desire to be with Jesus. If somebody's trying to put you down and tell you you're wasting too much time on the things of God, you can tell they're at the waters of Mara, the bitter waters. We're to be praisers. God said we're to go out, the praisers are to go out first. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Stand and see what God is going to do. We praise because we know it's done. We praise because we know it's done. My healing's done. My deliverance's done. My family restoration and my financial increase is already done. And because it's done, I praise the Lord. I know it's done, so I praise the Lord. That's why they went out first. That's why they faced the enemy. They knew the battle was the Lord's. They knew the victory was theirs. They knew it was already done. Somebody praise Jesus in this place. We need to praise Jesus way better than they do at the Barry Colts games. We need to praise Jesus way stronger than any sporting event. No matter where you go in this world, people will jump up and down and make noise for stupid idols. But we need to praise the Lord for who is the God of the universe. He is our God. We need to praise him. This is the year we're living in. Well, I don't feel like praising God. <laughs> well, I don't feel like uh, lifting my voice and shouting and clapping. That's because you don't know him. That's because your tongue's swollen. You're dehydrated. And we're going to get saturated today. <laughs> Dehydration is one of the first symptoms is that swollen tongue, unable to taste and see, unable to want to eat because you have no desire to eat because it doesn't taste right. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. 
His praise shall continually be in my mouth. See, praise has nothing to do with how you feel. Praise has nothing to do with how you feel. Praise has everything to do with what you know. I know that Jesus is my redeemer. I know that I'm on my way to heaven. I know that my body's healed. I know that he's my deliverer. I know, I know in whom I believe. That's why the apostle Paul said, I know in whom I believe. He said, I don't hope to know. He said, I do know. He is my savior. He is my Lord. Hallelujah. The people that complain about spiritual things have an empty garage. Say they're empty on the inside. Empty people will complain about somebody that's full. Right? When you're full of the Holy Ghost, people that are empty will complain about you because you're way too excited. You're too joyful. You're too expectant. You're too full of faith. How can you believe so radically? I'm sitting here after 16 years and I've seen what the Lord has done. He's built a $3 million property when we didn't have a dime. I can tell you that the Lord can do anything. And all we have to do is believe. He can start churches all over this province. I've seen him start churches all over this province through us. It's a miracle. Because I know who I am. I've seen him pull cancer out of, out of people's bodies. I've seen him erase and eradicate poor hearts. I've seen him... Take a, 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 a nail gun, an eye in the nail gun, in the eye of our sound man at the back, who 25 years couldn't see right because the nail went in his eye, and now it's totally healed, 2020 vision. I've seen miracle after, that's just in the last four or five months, that miracle after miracle in this house. I got to praise the Lord because it's done. Quit calling things the way you see them naturally. First thing that God did for Abram and Sarai was change their name. Why did God change their name? Why would God change your name when you're 100 years old? Because he's, he, God's destiny for Abraham was to be the father of many nations. But he wasn't speaking that over his life. And nobody else was speaking it over him. So God changed his name. The first thing he said, now your name is Abraham. Now you're the father of many nations. He's 100 years old. He's never been able to have a child. And now he's saying over his, he tells all his servants, all his slaves, everybody, call me the father of many nations. How many people this week have you said to, I'm healed. I'm prosperous. I'm blessed. I'm highly favored. No matter what it looks like, it doesn't matter what it looks like. That's what God says you are. And when you say what God says you are, you're seeing as he sees, and you're agreeing with it because you're calling it done. You're calling it done. My business is prosperous. I don't care what it looks like. Your business is, it's not fake. It's saying the truth. The truth will make you free. Facts have to bow their knee to truth. That's why they're teaching the kids so hard in the public school system that there is no truth, it's whatever you make it. That's a lie. We have the absolute, infallible truth. It's called the Word of God. What the Lord says must come to pass if it's believed. Call it forth in your life. My van is paid. What's the name of your van? Paid. What's the name of your house? Paid off. It's the will of the Lord. Faith begins where the will of God is known. I said faith begins where the will of God is known. Do you know he wants to pay your house off? Do you know that he wants to pay your debt? Do you know that he wants to restore your family? Do you know that he wants to heal your body? Do you know that he wants to save your entire household? What do you know about the Lord? you got to know what his will is. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm excited. See, see, healing isn't, isn't determined when the doctor says you're healed. Healing is determined when you know you're healed because of the report of the Lord. Praise God. 
So dehydration affects your tongue. Dehydration affects your mouth. The second symptom of dehydration is delirium. Everybody say delirium. I saw a lot of that at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Crazy people walking around talking gibberish, hugging trees, doing all kinds of weird stuff. Crazy people. I felt so sorry for them. They were delirious. They were dehydrated. See, when dehydration comes to the church, it does stupid stuff. <clears throat> One of the stupid things is, when a church is dehydrated, they think success is numbers. That's delirium. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches where to increase. The Bible says where to multiply. But the Bible calls success is obedience. If God tells you tomorrow to go across the road and bake a pie and give it to your neighbor, you're a success. Lots of things in the name of success are being built. But God's not asking for all of them. Some of them he is, but not all of them. We got to be obedient. Be obedience is worship. I said, obedience is worship. Doing what he asks us to do tomorrow is worship. Going to church is not, wor is not, obe is not worship. Go just going to church. It, it, it is part of it. But you got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What are you going to do those days? Live any way you want? Well, there's grace. No, you got to be obedient. Obedience is worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They were delirious. Now, it, it is so amazing to me that in verse 22, the name of the desert they walked into out of captivity in Egypt was called Shur. And God said this to me. I named the desert Shur because I knew delirium would make them unsure. Because when you get dehydrated, you're no longer sure. I'm not sure if he loves me. I'm not sure if he's working on my behalf. I'm not sure if I'm breaking through. I'm not sure if I even want to go to church anymore. I'm not sure if reading my Bible is as important as they think it should be. It's delirium. It comes through dehydration from a lack of the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> How many know it takes a little bit of work to take a shower every day? to suck back orange juice and drink some fluids. We're good at washing the outside of this natural body. But are we good at getting filled with the Holy Ghost? Are we good? Are we sure that he loves us? You're, you're not tested on your sureness until you're in a hot spot. God puts us or allows us to go into hot spots to make sure we know we're sure. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. He is my Deliverer. Do you know what the Bible says? That in the last days, philosophies of men and doctrines of demons are going to permeate the church. And if it gets a little tough, many people's love is going to wax cold. And many people are just going to walk away from the faith in the last days. Do you think we may be in the last days? Uh, yeah, unless we entertain the tar out of this generation, they won't even come to church. If we don't have the right programs, if we don't have the right smokes and lights and, and star power, then people won't come to church. But that's not what we're doing in this house. It's the anointing of the Lord. It's the presence of Jesus. It's the washing of the Holy Ghost. We may not have every procedure down proper, but we are a people that love the anointing of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm telling you that before this thing is done, Jesus is going to get glory. He's going to come in manifested presence, and he's going to move amongst his people, and people will see that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's not about us. Hallelujah. Delirium is tested in the wilderness of sure. I'm sure he's with me. I know he's working through me. Sure was a place where things didn't grow properly. Sure was a place, a wilderness place, where everything looked bad and didn't look productive. It was a season where everything wasn't going right. Have you ever had one of those? You don't know what God's doing. It doesn't seem productive. It doesn't seem like anything's advancing. It doesn't seem like you're getting a breakthrough. You got to know and be sure. Say, I got to be sure. I'm in the wilderness of sure. I got to stand in 
my confidence in Jesus and his word. I got to read my Bible and pray every day. I got to worship the Lord. And it doesn't seem to shift anything. It doesn't seem to move anything. But I'm going to stand still and see the salvation of my Lord. I'm going to stand and see him work on my behalf. I'm going to give him the battle and I'm going to take the victory. I'm going to be the person that he needs me to be. I'm going to stand there and give him praise when I shouldn't praise. When it looks so impossible that it shouldn't change, I'm going to believe that it can change. Because I'm I'm a God of faith. My God is a God of faith, and I believe in him. You, Say, I got to choose. I got to choose. I got to choose. I must be sure in whom I believe. Many people in our country that know Jesus don't praise the Lord because they're not sure what's going to happen next week. I'm absolutely sure. He's going to be with me. He's going to walk with me. He's going to teach me. He's going to cause me to know strategy. He's going to cause me to know a breakthrough. He's good to me all the time. He meets me in the valley. <laughs> he delivers me from the valley. He walks me out of the valley. He's with me always to the ends of the age. This is a year you're going to face the greatest darkness you've ever faced. And you're going to get the biggest breakthrough you've ever had. Because it's impossible. And anything that is impossible is going to be taken on by the God himself, our God himself. God's going to take our impossibilities and he's going to fight our battles. He said it. I'm going to praise him for it because it's already done. Praise Jesus. I'm sure. First symptom of dehydration is found in the mouth. Negative talking. Can't taste things right. Complaining. Say, that's not me. Second symptom of dehydration. Delirium. I'm not sure. I'm not sure God's for me. I'm not sure what's happening. I'm not sure there is a God. It's delirium. It's dehydration. Do you know how many people, if you could survey people in, in the North American church, aren't sure about what God's doing? They're delirious. Because in the presence of a living God, with liver, living water flowing through from your heart into your life, you can be absolutely sure it's going to be all right. You can be absolutely sure everything's going to work out. Sure, it's a little tough right now, but he's about to move. He's about to shift. He's about to shake my world. Somebody needs to praise him because you're sure. The third symptom I want to talk about is unconsciousness. You get dehydrated enough, you're going to go unconscious. Three days earlier, they had passed through the water, the Red Sea. Three days later, they can't even believe that what they passed through, God could get to them. Three days ago, they go through the Red Sea. Three days later, they're not sure if they're going to make it because they don't have enough of that stuff that was piled up on each side to drink. Three days. We're the third day church. I said, we're the third day church. This, the, we, we were born in the third day since the cross. Jesus knew you had the resilience to be alive now. You weren't born in 1396. You weren't born in 949. You're not a crusader of past. You're a crusader of present. You have the power of the Holy Ghost active in your life. God has the greatest anointing saved for last. The Bible says the first miracle in the Bible is John chapter 2. After three days. They run out of wine. You should look up all the third days. We're in the third day. It apparently looked like they were running out of wine on the third day of the wedding feast in John chapter 2. Jesus had taken his disciples. He's showing us a prophetic picture that there's a potential for the wine, the Holy Ghost, the power of God to dry up in the third day. But absolute obedience Obedience to be filled in an earthen vessel. 
to allow the washing of the word and the fullness of the spirit of God into your life can cause a wine to come forth that you have never seen ever in your life. There is an outpouring of the Spirit of God that's coming in your house, coming in your business, coming in your life like you've never seen before on this third day. But it takes a willingness to get filled in that water pot, to get filled with the Spirit of God and to allow it to be poured out. Say, I just can't get filled and hoard it for myself. I got to let it overflow. Say, I got to let it overflow. This is the day of overflow. This is the day of eradicating dehydration. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You've made me a little bit thirsty, a little bit dry, but I want to tell you something. He's here. Now, what? Now, in the story, he, Moses cries out in the day of dehydration. He cries out for the people of Israel, over a million of them. What are we going to drink, God? And God says, throw in a stick. Everybody say, throw in a tree. It's a prophetic picture. It's a, and you know, most of you know it's a prophetic picture of the cross and what Jesus has done. But I want to say it this way. Throw in a stick. Throw in a switch. You know what a switch is? Yeah, I received that a little bit. <laughs> they don't do that anymore. We put people in the corner and make them meditate evil things so that they get possessed, and then they grow up hating everybody. But in my day, they spanked. With a switch, my dad used a barber belt. He was a barber, nice thick one. Don't feel sorry for me. I needed it. <laughs> Obviously, it worked. Glory be to God. <laughs> well, spanking isn't appropriate anymore. Well, wait till you see what they turn out like. Putting some little kid in the corner to meditate on everything that they hate about you is not a good thing. Not good. Relieving that instantly with a spank on the butt automatically makes them, and then you give them a hug and say, it's over, forget it, we remember it no more. Hallelujah. And they're free. Anyway. God said, throw in a switch. Throw in a, throw in a branch. Throw in a stick into the, into the bitter water, into the marrow water. And I heard the Lord say this. When he did that, I heard the Lord say, stick with it. Everybody say, stick with it. Stay committed. Stay in that relationship. Stay in that job. Stick with it. We're stick with the people. I said, we're stick with the people. If you stick with something long enough, he'll switch it. He'll switch it. He'll switch it. When you stick with it, God will switch it. When you stick with it, God will switch it. When you stick with it, God will switch it. Too many people not sticking with it long enough for God to switch it. But God said, if you'll stick with it, I will switch it. They threw in a switch. They threw in a stick. And the waters became sweet. I'm almost done. I'm going to end with this a little analogy. Is that all right? I'm going to talk about Jesus on the cross. <clears throat> He's, in, I think I, I wrote it down. John 19, verse 28. Jesus said, hanging on the cross, he said, I thirst. He said, I thirst. Our Savior said, I thirst. Right at that moment, he knew what it felt like in Mara. He knew what it was like to... to to be so thirsty. It says in Psalms, I wrote the Psalm down, uh, Psalm 22, verse 15, my strength dried up like a pot's hurt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. These are words of Jesus. His mouth was so dry, his tongue couldn't be defastened from the top of his mouth. That's thirsty. So he, he says to the soldiers that are there, <laughs> he says, I thirst. 
And what do they do? They get a stick. And on the end of the stick, they put what? Who, who can remember? Vinegar, like sour grapes, sour wine, sour wine, which should have killed him at the state of dehydration he was in. But what they didn't realize, and it says, I, I, I never really saw this before. It says in verse 29, they filled a sponge with sour wine. And then it says, they put it on the end of a stick. And you know what the stick was? It was a hyssop stick. It says there right in the text. Now, if you don't know what a hyssop stick is, that's what the Old Testament priests applied the blood with a hyssop stick, sprinkled it all to consecrate the temple and all the things in the temple. It was a hyssop stick. The hyssop stick represents faith in our covenant on this side of the cross. So when they were uh, torturing the Lord Jesus by giving him sour wine, the Bible says that they had placed this cloth on the end of a hyssop stick, which symbolizes the switch. It symbolizes faith. They put what was sour on the end of faith, but we know that a switch took place because when they stabbed him in the side, water and blood came out. <laughs> Hanging on the cross, he made the switch. Glory be to God. In the driest season, he made the switch. When it was impossible to be dehydrated, he made the switch. It, it, it is a marvelous picture of how, no matter how dry we are or how impossible it may look or what's going on in our life and families or finances or what our future looks like, anything that's going on, the switch can be made if we will believe. If we will believe. Do I have some people of faith today that can believe that you don't have to be dehydrated anymore? You can be saturated with the love of God. You can be impregnated with the, with the joy of the Lord and full of the Holy Ghost and fire of God. The blessing of God is upon you. If you believe. Jesus, with the most important thing, he said, I thirst and they come to kill him with sour wine. But they didn't realize they put it on the end of faith. Praise you, Jesus. And the switch was made. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to pray this morning. And I know many of you might be facing things and are looking at situations and, and you feel pretty dry. But you don't have to be dry. Rivers of living water have been provided for you. And there is a switch that there is a stick that can be applied. There is, a, there is a cross that we can look at. There is a Lord that we can love. And he can cause a transformation. And he can call, cause us to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Every Christian is to be full of the Spirit of God. We're to be so full of life tomorrow that people see the life is unusual. We're supposed to be so full of the joy of the Lord that no matter what goes on around us circumstantially or situationally, we can show the love of God and that God is good and he has grace on our life and we're coming through and it's only a matter of time. God is working in you. So if you're dry, you're going to get saturated if you will believe today and receive the Holy Spirit of God in a fresh way. You got to choose. Hallelujah. God wants to give us a drink from a fire hose. He wants to overflow your life. Christianity isn't to be worked at. It's to be lived out. It's to be such a natural release of life and love. But if your Christian life is hard, you're finding it hard to read your Bible, you're finding it hard to pray, and you're just distracted all day long, you're dehydrated. And don't think for a minute you're not being affected in your mouth. Don't think for a minute that it's not affecting your, your mind. You are, you are thinking weird, and you don't even know it. If I walked up to those people in the Grand Canyon, they, they, they didn't know anything was wrong. They didn't know nothing was wrong. They were, they were dehydrated and delirious. Some of them were unconscious. And the day we were down there, one person died. It just passed. Because of heat. Because they wouldn't stay saturated. They wouldn't eat the food. They wouldn't 
They wouldn't drink the drink. They got overheated. And the enemy is doing everything in his power to cause the church to be so distracted by everything except the pre presence of the Lord. He doesn't want you in the presence of the Lord. And the presence of the Lord is here this morning. If you do not know Jesus personally, on the inside, you need to accept him into your life. It's not behavior he's looking for, it's belief. If you believe that he is your substitute, that he took your place, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, then you believe to receive him into your heart. It's, and it's so simple. Lord, I believe in you. I believe you took my place. I believe that you're my savior. Come into my life. And he does. He won't come unless you ask him. Hallelujah. Does anybody in this place need to do that this morning for the first time? I'm going to ask Jesus into my life. And I'm going to try to serve him all the days of my life. Everybody's good. You can have him on the inside and you can have his, the levels of him on the inside of you so low. <laughs> it's not what you know in your head. It's what you experience in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You got to choose. Keep kicking life your way or get him on the inside driving you his way. His way works. But we can't be dehydrated. We can't live a life after salvation knowing we're going to heaven and say, well, I'm going to just go do it any way I want. No, he will lead you. And it's, it's satisfying. It's, it's, it causes you to feel fulfilled every day of your life. Feel, it causes you to make, make you think that everything's going to be okay when it looks impossible. He can change anything. Hallelujah. So if you know you're... A little bit dehydrated or maybe a lot dehydrated. We're going to play, pray right now. I'm going to just lay hands on you. Because I don't want a dehydrated church. <laughs> you are the church. I want people so overflowing that they're in the mind of Christ. So overflowing that they're conscious and aware of the presence of God. So overflowing that their mouth sees and speaks positive things instead of negative things. That's how on fire the Lord wants us to be. Oh, so saturated in his fiery love.